Hello. Thank you all so much for joining the 2022 Individual Artist Awards workshop, workshop session with Kodiak. My name is Anzina Marari, and I'm a program officer at the Rasmussen Foundation, and I'm so happy to join you all today. Uh, we are so lucky to be joined by the Kodiak Arts Council. Uh, and in just a few moments, we will hear from Kodiak Arts Council Executive Director, Katie Oliver. Uh, before we do get started, we want to root ourselves in uh, our area today, wherever we are Zooming in from. And so I'd like to turn it over to Katie to lead us through a land acknowledgement. Katie? Great. Thank you, Anzina, and welcome, everyone. It's great to see you all. Since we are together tonight uh, in a virtual space, I would encourage you all to give thought to and recognize the indigenous peoples on whose land you live, work and gather. But like many of you, I'm joining tonight from Kodiak Island. And so my feet are planted on the traditional homeland of the Aleutic Sukyak people. And I acknowledge the 10 tribes of the Kodiak Aleutic region. And I recognize that the heritage, culture, knowledge, and importantly, artistic practices of the Aleutic people continue to enrich our communities. I'll share with you a little bit about the Kodiak Arts Council. Uh, if you're familiar with the organization and our work, we are the local arts agency for Kodiak Island. We are a nonprofit organization established in 1963. And like all local arts agencies, we work to promote, support, and develop the arts at the local level in recognition that the arts are an essential part of healthy communities. Uh, we began, the Arts Council began as a community theater organization, and we continue today as the resident theater company of the Gerald C. Wilson Performing Arts Facility, which we co-manage with our partners at the school district. We're also um, very much engaged in arts education work, and we employ artists as teaching artists. I know many of you uh, work with us leading school and community arts programming uh, and working with teachers to help local teachers use the arts as an approach to teaching and learning. Um, I love this photo of, of Bonnie, uh, local artist Bonnie Dillard, who was a longtime arts educator as well. Uh, this was right at the onset of the pandemic in April of 2020. She came uh, and painted a mural on the windows and doors of the uh, auditorium here. Uh, you may also know us as the organization that now manages the annual Crab Festival Art Show for exhibiting artists. And I recognize many of you as exhibiting artists from that show. We also host the Makers of Kodiak website to connect artists and makers with the buying public and we facilitate public art projects here in Kodiak. Again, it's great to see everyone. I'm glad you're here to hear directly from the Rasmussen Foundation program officers about this great opportunities for investments directly in individual artists. And, and Zina, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, it's so lovely to hear more about the work of the Kodiak Arts Council, and, and we will a little bit later on learn about some opportunities that are specific to Kodiak artists. So uh, before we jump right into the workshop, I do want to uh, root us in our time together today and um, uh, set us up with uh, our agenda for moving through the presentation. I do also want to introduce some of the Rasmussen Foundation colleagues that I have on the call. So we are joined by Monica Garcia Ichuak, who is a program officer at the Rasmussen Foundation and provides support to the Individual Artist Awards, as well as Karen Lowell, who is a contractor with the foundation, who's been with us for about three years and who provides direct one-on-one -on -one support to the artist. So if you've reached out about how to write your artist statement or how to draft your narrative, you will likely talk with Karen. And then we're also joined by Zuli Mason, who's been a contractor with the Rasmussen Foundation for about eight years, who provides us with some program support, event support, and um, other duties as assigned. Uh, and this program could not function without their support, of which I am so grateful. So the first thing we're gonna talk about today is a brief overview of the Rasmussen Foundation. We've already talked about the Kodiak Arts Council. 
We'll step then into an overview and a brief history of the Individual Artist Award program itself, uh, and then jump into the workshop component. Part of that workshop component is going to be an application walkthrough. So we will show you step-by-step -step how to create an account with the platform we use for the application, and then how to walk through the application uh, to make sure that you're setting up your application correctly and then dive a little bit deeper into the application components. We're also super lucky to be joined with a 2021 award recipient, Mayate Agopian, who will join us a little bit later to talk about her process in developing an application. Lastly, we'll leave some moments at the end for a Q&A and Katie will guide us through that. So real briefly, the Rasmussen Foundation began in 1955, and it was created by Jenny Olson Rasmussen to honor her late husband. And Jenny Olson and E.A. Rasmussen were Swedish immigrants to Alaska in the early 1900s, and they immigrated to, to Yakutat, Alaska, where Jenny Olson was a missionary and E.A. was an educator. The first grant the foundation ever made was for $250, and it was to support a church out in uh, Wasilla to purchase a projector. Many years later, the foundation has awarded over $400 million in grants across all service areas, arts and culture, social services, education, housing and homelessness, and of course, individual artists. Much of the foundation's grant making began in 2000 when the son of Jenny Olson and EA left his personal fortune to the family foundation. Now, when we think about the arts and culture investments, it's important to know that the Individual Artist Award program is the only, the only program of the foundation that funds individuals directly. Every other grant making program is to organizations or communities. And the overall miss mission of the Rasmussen Foundation is to make life better for Alaskans. So the giving is broad. Now, arts and culture are a family tradition. And this photo is uh, a snapshot of the Alaska Heritage Museum, which was developed by Elmer Rasmussen, who saw that many tourists or visitors to Alaska were purchasing art and artifacts, art artifacts from indigenous and Alaska native peoples and taking those outside of Alaska. He felt it was really important for these artworks and artifacts to remain in Alaska. So he developed the Alaska Heritage Museum, which, which is still standing today and reflects much of his collection. Now the Individual Artist Award program began in 2004. And this program was part of an overall arts and culture initiative uh, that, that supported artists, organizations, and community members. But again, the Individual Artist Award program is so unique in that it funds individuals directly. And the board gathered stakeholders, artists, and uh, people from across the state, and they determined that the best way and the most overall comprehensive way to support arts and culture in Alaska is to put money directly in the hands of artists. So the purpose of this program that's been around for 18 years is to really provide artists with dedicated time and resources for serious artistic exploration and growth. And in doing that, it strengthens Alaska's cultural resources. Since 2004, almost 600 grants have been given to artists representing more than 53 communities throughout Alaska. And there are three distinct awards in the Individual Artist Awards. There's the Distinguished Artist Award, which is a separate process that we won't really talk about today, the Project Awards and the Fellowships. Now the Fellowships Awards are $18,000 unrestricted grants for a short-term project or short-term exploration. And fellowship awards are available to mid-career or mature stage artists. We'll talk a little bit about that um, shortly. 
Project awards are $7,500 awards. There's 25 of those awarded each year. And those are available for artists across all career stages. And then of course the Distinguished Artist Award, which is a, a, a lifetime achievement award given to one artist each year who has dedicated a lifelong contribution to the arts and culture sector in Alaska. This is a separate process. It's done by nomination and selected by an all Alaska panel. Now the nomination period for the distinguished artist has ended, but we encourage you to think about a mature artist in your community who is deserving of this award. And we encourage you to nominate them next year. The nomination period opens in October and ends on December 15th. So that panel process is currently underway and we'll be excited to make that announcement in the next few months. So diving deeper into the project award and fellowship. So again, the project award is available across all career stages. And we can talk a little bit about how to identify what career stage you're at. The foundation recognizes emerging artists, artists that are mid-career, so at kind of a, a, a more rooted area of their art practice, and then artists that are more advanced and sitting in a mature phase. Now, in addition to that monetary award, the foundation uh, uh, also provides professional development resources. About three years ago, the foundation uh, began a partnership with the Anchorage Museum, and uh, the Anchorage Museum uh, hosts and facilitates several different professional development workshop series throughout the year for award recipients. And that's anything from how to write an artist statement to how to work with galleries or museums, how to get your work published. So it's really that professional strengthening of your art practice. And that is provided in addition to the monetary award. Again, these projects are short term. That one year uh, grant period begins in July and goes through the end of June. And so the projects have to be done within that one year, have a clear beginning and a clear end that can be articulated in a timeline. And in for a project award, the project, the artist must be able to articulate what the project budget is. It's a $7,500 flat award or flat grant. And so that budget must equate to $7,500. And again, if you're curious about what you can include in an artist budget, we can go over that during the Q&A and you're always welcome to reach out to us. And there are 25 awards uh, uh, given annually for the project awards. A new development to the Individual Artist Awards began a few years ago where we opened up the application process to include individuals and groups or collaboratives. So previously, only individual artists would be able to apply. But we understand the nature of art making is collaborative. And so three years ago, we extended this to include groups and collaboratives. And we'll define what that looks like a little bit later. Now fellowships again are that higher award that are more limited. They're limited in numbers of award and also limited in who can apply. So fellowships are 18,000. It's again, a one year period of time and they're only available to artists that are more steeped into their craft. So mid-career or mature and they're unrestricted. So the project can be a little bit more broad and expansive but again, must be able to be done within that one year period. Now, because the fellowships are limited, there are only 10 given each year, the disciplines rotate year to year. So about half of the disciplines that artists can apply in uh, are provided each year for the fellowships. And this year, the fellowships recognize media arts, multidiscipline, music, music composition, new genre, presentation introduction, interpretation and visual arts. We talk a little bit about the overall disciplines later on. And the fellowships are also available to individuals and groups. Now I do encourage you um, to put some questions in the chat. Uh, we're running straight through this presentation and, and don't really have many moments to pause. But if a question comes up, we encourage you to put that in the chat and we'll make sure that either we get to that question um, at the end during the Q&A 
or we follow up with you and make sure we, we respond to that need. Uh, we also encourage you to use your reactions button uh, if you feel so inclined, and that is at the bottom of your Zoom uh, window. So real briefly, we just want to give you a transparent picture of what the applicant pool looks like. And these are the total applications that we received in 2021. And so uh, you can see here that this is the project award uh, category. And we won't go through all of these, but you can see by the distribution of applications that visual arts received the most applications of any discipline. And this is pretty consistent year to year. We also see that some categories like dance or choreography or performance art uh, or new genre received few applications. And we bring attention to this because we know that there are more than two fantastic dance artists or dance groups or artists working in choreography across the state. And so we really wanna encourage those folks who, who maybe haven't applied before or don't see how they fit into this application to really reach out to us and, uh, and, and apply. We also look at the applications for fellowships in 2021, and you can see the distribution of applications are very consistent with those of project awards. Uh, the applications that see the most submissions are visual arts, music, music composition, literary arts, and folk and traditional arts. And this is consistent year to year. And we see that representation here. So again, these were the 2021 fellowships. And so these disciplines will not be eligible to apply for a fellowship this year. However, they will be uh, eligible to apply for a project award. So just breaking down what those 11 artistic disciplines are. The foundation recognizes choreography and dance, crafts, folk and traditional arts, literary arts and script works, performance art, multidiscipline, music or music composition, new genre, presentation interpretation, and visual arts. Now we won't spend time today defining all of these different disciplines, but I do encourage you to visit the website and the Rasmus Foundation guidelines for the individual artist awards that, that really break down what each of these disciplines are. But I do wanna call attention to a few of these disciplines um, that uh, uh, we get a lot of questions for. And one is performance art and presentation interpretation. Now performance arts are for original artworks that are done intended to be performed to an audience or be performed and then later presented to an audience. And performance art is broad. It can be something like live puppetry or it could be more contemporary performative action or theatrical action that's original. The difference between performance art and presentation or interpretation is that presentation and interpretation is existing work that is reimagined or reinterpreted or performed. So a clear example of presentation and interpretation is theater productions and theater work. This is work that's existing and is being interpreted or performed by the artist. We also wanna bring attention to new genre and multidiscipline. New genre would be any type of artwork that fits under a new technology or an emerging art form that doesn't quite meet any of these other disciplines. We might see something like augmented reality in the new genre category. And multidiscipline is for any art practice that uh, encompasses at least two of these different disciplines. So if someone is a visual artist, but they also work in literary arts or, are, or is creating a, a um, illustrated book uh, that's writing and literary, they might wanna apply under multidiscipline. Again, if you have questions about where you specifically uh, lie as an artist, please reach out to us. So a little bit deeper into what makes an artist group or collaborative. So an artist group or collaborative is any, um, uh, any combination of two or more individuals applying within one application. 
It can be an ongoing group or collaborative. It could be a theater company that's been in existence for 20 years, or it can be multidiscipline artists that have come together for a specific project. And groups or collaboratives can apply under a project award or a fellowship. And there are some specifications on the application. And when we get through that application walkthrough period, we'll go over what those specifications are. Little bit about the eligibility and criteria. So this is an Alaska-based and an Alaska-rooted award. And so an artist must be an Alaska resident and have lived in Alaska for the last two years and remain a resident for the duration of the grant. We tell folks that if you qualify for a PFD, you are eligible to apply for an individual artist award. It is for adults. And so we recognize that as 18 or older and for artists that are currently producing work. This is uh, intended for professional artists at any career stage. If there's someone who's interested in art or has an idea for an art project, this probably wouldn't be the right program for them to apply to. Some things that might make an artist ineligible is if they are currently enrolled in a degree seeking program related to the arts. If they're in aviation school, that would not make them ineligible. If they're working on a Bachelor of Arts or Master's of Arts, they would have to wait until they've graduated from that program to apply. Because again, the foundation recognizes artists that are uh, 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 rooted in their practice, currently producing, and are at stages of emerging mid-career or mature, and are creating works that are not done under the supervision of a professor or instructor. And likewise, works that are included as work samples must be done outside of a degree seeking program. The individual artist awards are also not needs-based. It's a merit-based uh, award and uh, very competitive. Um, we on average see about 300, sometimes close to 500 applications each year. Uh, and there's a total of 35 awards. And so it can be a little intimidating because of the competitiveness, but we always encourage artists to apply and apply again. And then if an artist has received an award, they must wait three years before applying again. And so a three-year gap of not having received an award. And we do this so we can um, expand the opportunities for other artists uh, throughout the state. And artists who have received an award are not eligible to use work samples that they used in a successful application. Now the criteria that makes up the award and what we'll talk a little bit more about once we get through the workshop is the artistic quality given experience. And so this is really rooted to your career stage. The panelists are looking for the quality of your work as it relates to you as an emerging artist, a mid-career or a mature artist. And this comes into play if an artist out applies outside of their career stage. So if an artist is emerging, but they're, they really want to receive um, a fellowship because it's a, a higher award amount and they apply as mid-career, it could actually be a disservice to the artist because the panelists might not feel that artistic quality or artistic level is at the career stage they identify as. The creative accomplishments thus far, and this is demonstrated in the artist's resume, and this just shows the panelists that you can achieve the project that you're proposing. The impact this project or this award will have on your growth, your development as an artist, and then making sure that the application is complete. Now we will say that uh, applications must be complete in order to be advanced to the panel. If an application is missing one of the required components, it will not advance. And so an artist statement, for example, is required. If an artist has forgotten to upload their artist statement or has uploaded a blank document in that place, it, that application will be considered incomplete and will not advance. So we always, always, always uh, ask folks to double, triple check their work and make sure everything that they've uploaded is correct. Now I've mentioned a panel. So the individual artist awards is reviewed and determined by a national panel of experts across the field. So staff from the foundation do not make determinations on the award recipients. We wanted to try to level the playing fields 
for all of the artists across the state and remove any type of bias that might exist. And so we convene a group of national artists, arts administrators, arts experts from across the US to meet and review all of the applications. And it's a three-step process. The first step is an individual review by each panelist that is working within a specific discipline. If a panelist is a choreographer, that panelist will be assigned all of the dance applications, et cetera. The second round is for all of those panelists within that discipline to meet together and review that discipline's application. So all of the panelists working in dance or choreography will meet together and review all of the applications within that discipline and make a selection to advance to the third stage of review, which is the final review where all panelists of all disciplines meet together, review those as shortlisted applications and make the really difficult decision of the 25 project awards and 10 fellowships. And I will say I've been a part of this process for three years and I think my colleagues on the, on the call can agree. The panelists take this process very seriously and they really uh, thoroughly review these applications and are rooting for the artist's success. And so it's a very thorough process and these panelists are very mindful and uh, excited about Alaska artists. And what the panelists are looking for is the same as the criteria that, uh, that artists have in preparing their application, the quality of work, the creative accomplishments, or just evidence of being able to complete the project proposed, how this, how this pro project, how this award will advance your growth as an artist will help you further develop. And then again, making sure that the application is complete. Now, if the application is missing components, it will not advance to the panel. However, if the narrative component, if the narrative answers are incomplete, or lacking in clarity, that might impact the panelist's perception of the work. The work samples might be great, but the narrative question, you know, what the project is, if that's not fully developed, it might not give the panelist a good sense of what you want to do as an artist. So really thinking about completeness overall um, and making sure that you're articulating who you are as an artist and what you wanna do with this award really clearly. One note that we do wanna bring attention to, just so uh, uh, we have some mindfulness, um, is cultural appropriation and responsible creative collaboration. Uh, the Rasmussen Foundation is, is really committed to um, uh, uh, mindfully uh, uh, acknowledging the work of indigenous artists and Alaska native artists um, and creating an equitable uh, platform for artists to be able to share their work. And so about three years, we started working with a cultural content expert who reviews applications that have cultural content or any um, uh, concerns of cultural appropriation. And so what I mean by cultural appropriation is essentially the unacknowledged or inappropriate, inappropriate adoption of customs, practices, ideas, designs, artworks of one people or society by members of another that are typically more dominant. And this can look like a lot of different things across the arts sphere. Uh, what we see that's present when there's a responsible creative collaboration or, or cultural exchange is that the proposal, the project, the, um, uh, the topic will have free prior and informed consent. So uh, images, artworks, collaboration is not done without the consent and uh, involvement of um, that uh, 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 cultural um, artist or cultural organization. There's shared control over process and product. There's acknowledgement and attribution, respect for cultural differences, and reciprocity and benefit sharing. We'll also be through the Anchorage Museum providing a panel discussion on cultural appropriation on February 15th. Uh, we'll be sharing that information out um, shortly. And part of that panel will be our cultural content reviewer. 
So if you're curious about this topic or wanna to learn more, we really encourage you to attend that panel discussion that again is on February 15th and will be hosted by the Anchorage Museum. All right, just a couple more notes before we jump into the workshop. So the Individual Artist Awards is just one award and one resource for artists working throughout Alaska. And we wanted to share a couple of more resources that if you're not aware of, we encourage you to research and gain more information on. And these are through the Alaska State Council on the Arts. And the three we'll highlight are the Harper Arts Touring Fund, Cultural Collaboration, and Arts and Education. And all of these programs fund the arts and artists in different ways, whether it's touring and performance arts, whether it's cultural collaboration for uh, cultural workers working directly with youth or supporting artists in the schools. So if you have questions about these programs or wanna learn more, we encourage you to reach out to Alaska State Council on the Arts and Laura Forbes, who is the Director of Education and who oversees these programs. The other opportunity we want to bring to your attention is a new program developed in partnership with the State Council on the Arts and the Foundation and this is the Adaptation and Innovation Grant Program. It started last year as a COVID response and emergency grant to support artists and organizations in being apt, able to quickly adapt and change their practice and support whatever they needed to, to continue working through it through COVID. This is such an important uh, award and an important program, especially at living through this ongoing pandemic. So even though it was started as an emergency response grant, it's continuing as a recovery grant. So this grant supports artists uh, with anything they need to do to continue their practice, to adapt their practice, to meet their current audiences during and responding to the current climate, or different ways they can innovate their practice to keep their programs and practices going. Again, this is overseen by Laura Forbes at the Alaska State Council on the Arts. So we really, really encourage you to reach out and see if you qualify for any of these programs or ask for more information. Next up, I'm gonna bounce it to Katie with the Kodiak Arts Council uh, to talk a little bit about the specific opportunities available to Kodiak artists. Katie? Great, thank you, Anzina. Uh, these are a couple of opportunities we wanted to highlight for you this evening in case you weren't aware. The Kodiak Arts Council also runs an artist awards program. Um, they're relatively modest awards. Uh, it was about three or four years ago that the board of directors for the Arts Council really took um, a deep look at our intent and what we wanted to do with this awards program. It had previously been known as um, artist scholarships. And uh, with the interest and intent in really uh, um, attracting and speaking to practicing artists in Kodiak, it was rebranded as our Artist Awards um, program. So the application period opens annually in April. It's a very simple um, three question um, proposal that we'll ask you to respond to. And recently um, the awards range for three to $500 Last year, we gave out eight awards and um, they supported activities uh, to allow artists to purchase new materials, to take on new projects. Um, some artists were pursuing professional development and enrolling in um, workshops. Um, I'm happy to talk to folks more about um, the artist awards and those will be published on our uh, website in March. And then we also run a local teaching artist roster. If you are an artist that might be interested in um, teaching others. We have a wide variety of opportunity. We can connect you um, to adult students, or we have lots of opportunities um, teaching youth, both in school and community programs. And we do offer a lot of professional development and training to help get you comfortable and feeling confident uh, as a teaching artist. So um, if you don't know where to find me, I'm at the Arts Council, but my email is my name, Katie, K-A-T-I-E, at KodiakArts.org. Happy to connect with you about any of these specific local opportunities. Thanks, Enzina. I'll turn it back to you. Thank you so much, Katie. Okay, uh, so that wraps up the uh, kind of informational portion of this workshop. 
And just a couple frequently asked questions that we get a lot is, can I apply for more than one award type? No, unfortunately. As an individual artist, you can only submit one application, either a project award or a fellowship. Um, you can only apply under one discipline unless you're selecting that multidiscipline category. And if you are working as part of a group or collaborative, you can also only apply for one application. So if you have an individual arts practice, but also work with a group, you need to determine uh, which type of application you would like to apply for this year as an individual or as part of that group or collaborative. You can apply uh, more than once if you've received an award, but again, you must wait that solid three year period between uh, receiving your award and applying again. Uh, the individual artist award is taxable. So we encourage you to reach out to your local community councils for support on that. And also to your accountant to determine how you could best approach that since it is a taxable, taxable income. And then de determining your career stage is really rooted in how long you've invested in your practice and how much you've developed. And so an emerging artist is, is an artist that is rooted in their practice. They have a developed portfolio of work. They have some element of exhibition or working with other artists or organizations, um, uh, but they're new in their practice. And uh, just to say, not everyone has to have exhibited or shown their work, but an emerging artist has to demonstrate that they have a developed voice as an artist, even if it's emerging and growing, and they have a developed portfolio of work. Now, a mid-career artist is someone that has um, practiced in their specific craft for multiple years. They've been recognized or acknowledged by their community or outside of their community, national or international, as a working artist. And they have years of a developed portfolio. And a mature or advanced artist, artist is someone who is seasoned in their craft, has acknowledged acknowledgement for years in their practice and has a resume or art history that reflects um, a years and lifelong exploration. Now, as we work into the work, workshop, workshop session, again, we will start with just a walkthrough of the application. Where do you go to create an application? How do you walk through that platform? We'll dive deeper into the narrative components uh, the, and the attachments, uh, like the statements and the resume, and then we'll go through some work samples. I do want to give everyone a heads up that when we get to the narrative portion, we will be experimenting with breakout room sessions. And we ask for some grace and patience. We are doing our own tech this evening. Um, and you know we've done some run-throughs, but uh, glitches always come up. So we, uh, in advance, thank you for your grace as we navigate through that. You were already put into a breakout room. So once we open that, you will be put directly into that breakout room to work on an exercise with your peers in that room. We also recognize that not everyone wants to go into a breakout room or doesn't feel comfortable. So you can always leave that breakout room to return to the main gallery. And we'll go through that exercise as a group and have it be more of a conversation. But we encourage you to work in that room with your peers it's a writing exercise uh, and takes you through one of those narrative questions. So it's a really great start of your application. So just a heads up, either have a document open on your computer or a piece of paper and pen ready for when we get into that breakout room. Just All right, so part one is the application walkthrough. So to get to the Individual Artist Award application, if you've never applied before, you just visit our website and there's a few tabs that you will see on the main landing page. You could click right on this picture if it pops up or you can, see, you can get to the arts page a number of ways. You can select grants or arts and that will take you to the Individual Artist Award program. If you already have a uh, account, so if you've applied before within the last, I think, 10 years, you will have an account within the system. So you can go directly to the grants logon. However, 
If you need to set up an account or want to circumvent the tabs, um, you can select the button apply for IAA. So the way we got to this page was we clicked grants at the very top. We then clicked individual artist awards and project awards and fellowships. So that's the navigation to get to the page with the button for apply for IAA. So once you click that apply for IAA, it will take you directly to the grant portal, the application portal, which is the same location as the grants log on. It's the same thing. Once you get to that uh, log on page, you have to set up your account if you have not done so already. And this is important. So this is where you have to decide if you're applying as an individual artist or a group and collective, because the application questions are a little bit different. So you make your determination, individual artist, art group or collective and hit continue. And then you'll get to this landing page. If you have applied previously, you will see your previous application enclosed or active if you have a pending or overdue report. Um, or if you've started your application, it will be in drafts. Uh, this is an example of someone who has not yet started an application. So these are blank. And because the award is a grant, the language around that within this portal is your requests. So it's your grant request, which equals to your grant application. So the way that you start your application fresh is to hit this button on the left under grant programs to start your application. Now, a couple date reminders. The online application is due March 1st. So we have a, a less than two months uh, before we're there. And a couple of years ago, the foundation started a draft review or early review deadline. And this is always on February 14th. Easy to remember, it's always Valentine's Day. And this is a draft review. So this is where staff will go through and look at your application for completeness. We do not look at it for content or context. We are looking at it to say, yes, the artist statement is added. Yes, the work samples are opening correctly. Yes, the resume is there. If those components are not there, we can reopen your application and say, your application was incomplete. Um, here's a, a link to reapply. However, if you get your application in after February 14th, it is received as is. And this is a this happens um, unfortunately every year. Someone's worked very hard on their application. They submit it March 1st and it's missing a statement and it's incomplete and cannot advance to the viewer. So we really, really, really encourage you, if you can, to get it in early and also to save your work, to work those questions that we'll get to in a moment in another. Um, platform like Word or Notepad or, or whatever, and save that and copy and paste. Every application, every portal, even the best portals and online applications will crash if there is high usage. So if lots of people are applying on March 1st, it's going to slow down the portal and there might be a glitch in the system. You might lose power. Your computer might crash. And if it's submitted at March 2nd, midnight, it will be considered late and will not advance. So save, save, save your work. Work outside of the program, copy and paste in. All right. So once you start your application, there will be several headers that break down the application. We uh, advise you to start with the instructions. This will take you through the guidelines of the application. You can also print out the guidelines to follow along as you make your application. The guidelines dive deep into def different definitions of career stages, criteria, um, uh, disciplines, et cetera. You then have to fill out your cover sheet, which is where you identify if you're applying for a project award or fellowship, your career stage, your artistic discipline, and then again, if you're applying as an individual or group, save, 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 advance, this will only appear if you are applying as a group or collaborative. You enter the name of your group or collaborative. 
If you don't have a name for the group, if it's a new group for a specific project, make up a name for that project. Um, identify how many what we call collaborators are in your group. For the sake of this application, collaborators are the project director and project lead. So any members of the group that have leadership or authority in the direction of the group. Every project has to have at least one project director and an undetermined amount of project leads. Uh, because this is an individual award, and so it has to be given to an individual, and that project director will be the individual in the group that receives the monetary award and then disperses it as they see fit and as the group decides. So that person is very key. Now, project directors and project leads, anyone that has a, a leadership component in that group will also be ineligible to apply for three years should they be awarded. We also recognize that groups and collaboratives look like a lot of different things, might be a 50 person choir or a two person collective. So if there are lots of members at large that are coming in and out and don't have ownership over the group activities or leadership, we just wanna know how many of those members there are, but we don't need to know who they are if they don't have a leading role. Every application has to uh, submit a timeline. Again, that timeline is taking you taking the panelists step by step through what will happen on July first. A little a little um, error there uh, through June thirty first of the next year. And this is just so the panelists know you thought through this project and that it's realistic to achieve in um, that one year period. Project awards will be required to submit a project budget. Fellowships, because they are unrestricted and can be a little bit more broad in their use, do not require a budget. You won't see that in your application, just the project award. There are several, several eligible expenses that can be incorporated in a project budget. If you're not sure, we encourage you to reach out to us. And then work samples. So these are where, uh, this is a really, really strong um, component to your application. And we encourage you um, uh, to really make sure that you're representing your work in the best way possible and that work samples be within five years. If a work sample is older than five years, we really, really um, ask that you provide explanation for why you're including an older work sample. Again, this is for currently producing artists. And so if there's a context for why you're including an older work, if it relates to your newer work, that's great. Just post that in the description because otherwise the panelists might question. I will, uh, I do wanna note that every field must be filled out to submit your application. You can move through your application, but once you hit submit, if these fields are not completed, you won't be able to submit. So every field must be completed. And then finally, view your PDF so you can make sure everything's formatted the way you'd like, all your attachments are showing up there, save it for your records, but until you hit submit application, it will not go through. Once you are satisfied with your application, you must hit I agree and then hit submit. We also encourage you to save a draft, or if you want to work on your application and come back to it, you can save the draft and then come back to it at any time. All right, this is the preparation that in a few moments we will move into our breakout room. So the next part of this workshop is to go over the narrative components of your application. And so there are five different narrative components. One is to provide a clear and concise overview of the proposal. What are you going to do if you receive the grant award? So a really concise overarching summary, and then the more in-depth description of your project or fellowship focus. And then getting back to that criteria, how will this proposal or project enrich or advance your growth, your career, your evolution as an artist, and then getting to the root of why you practice and getting to the root of the passion in your craft. Why is your work important? Why is it important to you, your audience, or your community? 
And what we hear from the panel is that they want to know who you are as an artist. This is an individual artist award. It's as much about the artwork as it is about the artists. And so the panelists want to know who you are, what your unique story is an artist, and why you make the work you, you make. And again, that timeline for project awards and fellowships and that um, uh, budget for project awards. And these narrative components have word limits. So keep it concise, keep it clear, have there be consistency across your uh, artist statement, across your work samples, across your project. Make sure you're getting to the compelling nature of why you work as an artist and why you make the work you do. And always, always, always make sure that your application is complete. So before we move on, um, we wanted to hear the point of view of an artist who received an, uh, a project award last year. And so we're super, super lucky to be joined today by Maite Agopian, who received a project award for puppetry. So uh, for the next few minutes, uh, I'd love to turn it over to Maite to talk about how she approaches the application. Okay, thank you. Um, so <laughs> I'm really excited to talk to you about what I experienced just a year ago. Um, I applied as an emergent artist um, as I'm doing puppetry since four or five years. Um, and I have a you know, I, as I was still working and raising family, and so um, I just feel like I knew what I wanted to do. I know, but I, but I really was an emergent artist. Um, I'm also a teaching artist here in Fairbanks. I do puppetry. I do um, shadow puppetry, um, and I do wood puppets and papier mache for children and adults, um, depending on the project. Um, so for this project, for the award, I took a month, um, a solid month, which means that uh, my goal was to have it ready by the first deadline, so the February 14, because um, of a few things. I wanted to make sure that I would have the chance to add anything if I forgot something. So that was my, my anxiety for <laughs> talking, uh, so that if anything was incomplete, I could, they could let me know and I could do it. I also know that I can procrastinate and these projects are long to write and often um, so I, whatever the, the deadline you give yourself, but I would highly <laughs> ask you to not do the last minute because usually the last week, even if you work for it, as long as you, you, you can work a year on a project and so the final week is so intense and, um, and for me I wanted to I, I needed to dive into it and do as much as I could, but not like wait and wait and wait and wait. So um, I also, yeah, for me, like I like to apply early. Um, it's also maybe a sign that you're really motivated and that you're really doing your work, um, but that's just my thing. Um, so the first thing I did was really doing my homework uh, by participating at these workshops, really looking at the at the toolkits that is available. There is a lot of like all of these slides and and all this info. I I really took time to look at them and 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 put these some of these words um, in a in a page so that I would always go and have them in mind and go back and see if it would really fit what was asked. Um, uh, I, of course, I had been thinking about it for a while. I didn't start it right at that moment. Um, it was a process, um, but, um, but I really, but I kind of, but these three weeks, um, was, was this month of like really doing this, what I like spending the time to describe what I wanted to do was, was that focus. Um, so I took yeah, three full weeks to write my narrative. So taking this question, putting them in a doc, um, going back to them, changing a lot, often, um, you know, spending time then, you know, spending time on the budget and, 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 and the timeline. And so really um, going back and forth on it. Um, 
and once I had the narrative and most of my cost and statement and, and visuals, I had a bunch of questions. And um, at that moment, uh, I knew what I wanted to do. I had a clear idea, but I, I really was a little bit stuck with a few things. And I reached out to the staff and that was really very scary. <laughs> <laughs> it was so scary for me to do that, <laughs> to reach out, to send what you're doing. It's something you, you know, you have in your heart and you don't know, nobody really else is looking at what you do and you have no idea if you are even in the right direction. But uh, it was wonderful to have feedback. Um, it was Karen who had, who gave me the feedback. She first answered all my precise questions, so that was very useful. And then she offered to actually give me actual feedback on on the on the on the proposition, on the narrative. And and that was I didn't expect that. And that was really um, so important because it it was very kindly positive feedback that I got, and also very constructive. Um, items that I could um, that I worked on and integrated and to probably make my my work just stronger and so I felt like I learned a lot by by reaching out and I felt really um, uh, better about my work I felt like okay maybe this is this is something that is going somewhere um, I also had a friend for last editing um, check um, the work sample was a little bit hard because I think as a as a emerging artist, maybe you don't have a ton, you might not have the right quality, or um, I had performance videos, but they were not really great. So I can so I again using the toolkits about how make how to make better pictures. Um, I used that. I re redid some pictures and reworked on some editing of some pieces of videos that I had and. Um, and put that together. I guess um, I struggle a little bit with that. And, and I, I would suggest to put them in the order of importance in relation to your work, um, in, in significance of what you're talking in your narrative. Um, that's actually a feedback I got later. Um, and it really takes a few days just for that. <laughs> So um, I think it's so easy to maybe underestimate. We feel like we have done so much work on the narrative and the timeline and the budget. And we're like, okay, pictures, right? It's kind of the easy part. And it takes another three or four days just to like, because of all these details and, and making sure things work. And so really count, count, count time for that, just for that aspect alone. So. To conclude, I just wanted to say that it was very intensive, a very, <laughs> very exhausting few weeks <laughs> to like really dive into this. But what I remember uh, coming out of it was that I was very relieved and I was very happy. Like I realized when I, when I sent it out that I had for the first time spent so much time focusing on trying to express what I was um, doing, what I wanted to do, how I wanted to do it. And that was going to be my plan. And I, at that point, I was like, if I get the reward, it's amazing, but I know what I want to do. And so I can keep on that timeline and plan, and it might take longer because of funding and anything, but I really remember how during that process consciously and, and thoroughly um, helped me actually for the whole spring, because you know about it only months later. And so you still have time to do a lot <laughs> before that. And so, um, so yeah, I, I think it's an amazing opportunity um, to, to try to express and do what we love to do and, and to share that. So. Thank you, and I'm. I hope you will <laughs> get rewarded. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Thank you so much, Maite. It's so lovely to hear your perspective and to learn a little bit more about your practice. I definitely feel inspired, um, and I I loved hearing what you were you were, you were articulating about the resources and taking the time to really invest in 
thinking about how to answer the questions and how to formulate your portfolio, uh, making sure your work samples are in a, a strong order, making sure there's consistency between what you're saying in your narrative questions and those work samples. Um, it's so lovely to hear what your process was and it's a great um, transition as we move into our breakout room. So I'm gonna bring us back to our shared screen. And I do just wanna give folks a heads up that we might be going over time just a little bit. We're scheduled to end at seven o'clock. We might go over just a bit. Uh, we encourage you to stick around with us as long as you can, but understand that some folks might have a hard stop at seven o'clock. So our next activity is going to put into practice some of what Mayate was saying with writing about your work. And so we're gonna get to the passion of your practice. Why is your work important to you, your audience and your community? Sometimes we get asked from artists what the panelists look at for, or what's more important, the work samples or the narrative. And it's a little bit of all of it together. Some panelists will go right to your work samples first. Some will read your artist statement first. Some will read your narrative first. What's most is important is, is that there's consistency across all of it. And being really mindful about your work samples because that is what you are showing the artists in your practice. And we'll talk about those in a moment. So for this next breakout room, there's three steps. The first step is, um, uh, it, I don't think we have time. So your team leader who is in your breakout room will introduce themselves and kind of set us up. We're gonna take about five minutes to do a free write. And the question you're responding to is why is your work important to you, your audience or your community? Take about five minutes, just jot it down, nothing formal, just jot it down. And then the next step is gonna take about 10 minutes within your breakout room to talk this through with your peers. So one volunteer will share out what they wrote. And then we're gonna ask everyone in the room to, to report back what they heard. So that person will stay silent and the peers in the room will share what they heard the artist was saying through their brainstorm. And the idea is to get a perspective on what other people are hearing in your writing. Writing about ourselves as artists is very, very challenging because we are rooted in our work. It's sometimes, for some folks, not everyone, um, it's sometimes really hard to be able to, to narrow down what your practice means to you. And so this is an opportunity to get it out and hear from your colleagues. So in a moment, we are going to um, send you to your breakout room where your breakout room leader will repeat these steps and guide you through the exercise. Again, it's 15 minutes. So have your writing implement handy, and then we'll come back together and continue with some of the rest of the presentation. And again, if you're not comfortable going into that breakout room, feel free to stay in the main Zoom and we'll workshop through this all together. Um, Karen, I'm gonna ping on you. Can you open up those break rooms? Um, if you feel comfortable, do you feel comfortable sharing a little bit about what you wrote? Sure, do you want me to read it? Yeah, you can read it or kind of summarize. Okay, um, so what I did was I tried to pull in the different aspects of um, what I do because it's very, some people think it's very different art and then um, education and, and culture bearing and bringing that all together. So I just kind of shared um, what I wrote was that I share my art and my story with the hopes of encouraging others. I continue to seek out ancestral techniques, history and guidance with the hopes of sharing with others. And my goal is to foster a stronger educated and empowered generation of religious people through art. So a little rough around the edges, but trying to pull those together. And um, Amber or Zuli, would you reflect back to Hannah what you heard? Um, I heard that creating 
art for Hannah is very important to her because um, she feels um, the need to um, educate and be a, a culture bearer. Um, Great, thank you. Amber? I pretty much heard that Hannah is trying to help the younger generation feel more inspired to be who they feel that they are and who feel connected to their culture in whatever way they feel the most comfortable. Great, great. And Hannah, I heard that uh, in your writing, you're trying to pull in different components um, the art side of your practice and then the culture bearer side and trying to bring that together in one. Where did, were we, were we close? <laughs> yeah, definitely. I think that um, Amber probably nailed it on the head more, but she, she's got an unfair advantage because she knows me, <laughs> knows what I do already. <laughs> um, it was all Great, great. So I think we have a couple more minutes um, before we uh, kind of bring everybody back from the room. Um, so uh, Amber, do you want to do you want to share what you wrote? I pretty much just wrote about what I do with the museum and you know, my, my job title is the gallery coordinator. So I work with all of our artists and try and help them. You know, I promote their work in the store and I do all of that and working with all of them and getting to see how much they love their culture and how they interpret it helps me stay really connected. So I kind of just wrote about that and just how being at the museum helps me feel connected in that way, I guess. Awesome, thank you. Hannah, do you mind sharing what you heard Amber say? It might be, again, <laughs> an advantage because you know each other, but. <laughs> I heard the keywords connection and staying connected along with the Elite Museum and working with artists and the encompassing of that um, being her purpose right now with her in her job position. Great. Julie? Yes, Hannah articulated <laughs> very well um, what, what I also heard Amber say. Yeah. Yeah. I also heard you speak, Amber, to your passion of um, working with artists and feeling inspired by the artists that you work with. Yeah, I, I love my job. And actually there are lots of my artists in this meeting. So it's kind of nice to see them branching out and taking those opportunities. Awesome, thank you. Um, I have closed the breakout room, so folks are going to start joining us again. Uh, thank you both for working through that exercise with us. There's my timer. Thank you. Yeah. So about that. I think I got accidentally moved from my breakout room, so how do I return? We have closed the room, so everyone oh. should be joining us momentarily. Oh, I thought I got kicked out. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> No, every, they're closing in seven seconds, so you're okay. <laughs> yeah. All right, I'm seeing everyone coming back. Thank you so much for going through that exercise and um, giving us patience as we work through this tech. Um, you know, we, we are again running close to time, but I wanna turn it over to a volunteer if they'd like to share out just 
you know, a few seconds about, um, about uh, that exercise and if they found it beneficial. If you would like to volunteer, you can raise your hand or just unmute yourself. Oh, yep. Hi. Hi, Cindy Roberts. Well, that's my mom. This is her computer, <laughs> yeah. So I knew I was gonna get some, some trouble for that, but my name is Brett Roberts. And um, no, I just wanna say, it was great exercise. Uh, luckily, what I wrote, I didn't have to read because we didn't have time. But some some of the other, uh, another uh, young artist had uh, had to read hers, and we started giving her feedback, and then it was over. So we started. I think it just happened a little too fast, maybe. Yeah. So that was my only thing. But other than that, we were. I felt like we were getting somewhere. So. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, we, we apologize for how quick it was. You know, we want to be mindful of the time and just give everyone an introduction in how you can start generating the responses to these questions and then how you can work with your peers to get feedback. We always recommend that you show your artist statement, you show your narrative answers to two people, someone who is in the art world who understands art practices and then someone who isn't. So you can get that feedback and that perspective from multiple sources. Okay, so we're gonna jump through the rest of this presentation. Again, we invite you to stick through it with us, but if you have to exit at seven, we understand. So we just wanna jump through a, the, the uh, next few components to the narrative, which is the artist statement. And the artist statement really connects to that, again, passion in your art making. And it's the how, the what, and the why of you as an artist. And so we really encourage you to kind of go through the same type of exercise that you just did to brainstorm the what you are trying to do in your work, why you are doing it, that speaks to the why your work is important, and how are you doing it. The panel really wants to get a sense for you as an artist in your artist statement. It's not just about your project. So your artist statement should be a general overview of your full artistic practice. It should not be an artist statement for your project. That's where the narrative descriptions come into play. So first we encourage you to brainstorm that who, what, where, why, and how, and then start pulling out words from that brainstorm to create a structure or an outline, and then start taking that outline and drafting it into full sentences that really flesh out those different components. Edit, get rid of the jargon, get rid of any buzzwords. What we hear from panelists is that they want you to talk to them like you would talk to a friend about why you love what you do. So they want it to be they want it to be clear and direct and really to get to the passion of your work. It does not have to be an academically drafted document. In fact, the panel just wants to get to the heart of your work and then give it to, give it to a couple people to read it, to help you proofread it, and to let them tell you what they heard and if it came across the way that you intended. Some general statements to avoid right, which don't talk to the uniqueness about your work are, my work is intuitive, I do art because I have to. This does not give the panel the unique perspective of you as an artist. It doesn't get to your point of view. My work is about my experiences. My work is about the organic and the synthetic, or it's a personal journey. I pour my soul into each piece. These general statements don't really capture the uniqueness of your practice as an, as an artist. A powerful artist statement, and this is an excerpt of Maya Tay's statement, talks about what she loves in her work. What she loves in her puppetry are its possibilities. And then she talks about what those are. What she sees puppetry is music and rhythm, and then talks about that. What she sees in puppetry is that it's inspiration and talks about that inspiration. She's pulling the panelists into her practice and into the heart of her work and this inspires the panelists and they wanna come back to your application, they wanna know more and they wanna see you succeed. All right, next is the artist resume. Now the artist resume 
is an opportunity for the panelists to see that you're a currently producing artist and it helps them understand that you're able to do what you're setting out to do. And the resume should just reflect a history of your practice as an artist. This is specific to your art making. It should not have your work history if it's not related to the arts or any other accomplishments if they're not related to arts. If you're a pilot, your pilot background should not be in your artist resume unless you're taking aerial photographs from a plane and that inspires your painting, right? So it should be only relevant to your art making. And resumes all look different. It might be a narrative um, history uh, talking about your roots and beginning as an artist, but it might be a little bit more structured and include your contact information, your training, education, if you've done any apprenticeships or, or mentorships, if you've exhibited or been published or provided workshops, anything that relates to your practice and your uh, process as an artist goes on the resume. This is just a basic template. Mayate referred to a toolkit that we have on the website. I really encourage you to go to that website, website rasmussen.org. And if you click on grants and individual artists or arts, it'll take you to the individual artist page. If you scroll down, we have a toolkit that provides you with a ton of resources. It gives you three blank resume templates that you can just plug your information into. And it also gives you resources on how to take good images just from a smartphone. Some of the common mistakes we see in resumes are inconsistencies across the resume, things not appearing in chronological order. Again, this might be might um, not be helpful to the panelists to understand your history as an artist. Contact information is missing implying something happened when it didn't, or just missing pertinent information. Now, some common, these are some comments, and I'll just go through a couple that we've received directly from panelists on applications. And so we really encourage panelists to give feedback to artists. And this is something as an applicant, you can opt in or opt out of. We encourage you, if you're open to it, to receive that panel feedback, because that feedback will help you grow as an artist and help guide your next application should you not get awarded. So some of these questions come from the panel and really dive into some components that were left off of the application. What does it mean to you to create a new body of work? This panel wanted to, to know more from the artist about the meaning of their work. What specifically are you looking to create? In this applicant, they did not really specify what their project was. And so regardless of the quality of the work, the panel just didn't really know what they wanted to do. Your artist story and statement are compelling and thoughtful, but your answers to the narrative questions were vague. So this is that consistency piece. There was inconsistency between the artist statement and the narrative. So really making sure that there's that clear, concise, and consistent nature to the work. Now this gets to some questions that we've gotten from artists in the past, which is what's the strategy? How do I get to the A? Like, how do I get to the award? And, and we really encourage artists to take the strategy out of the equation and really present the best package of your work as an artist. So focus on presenting the best complete package of your work, strong work samples, consistent and compelling narrative and complete and consistent uh, resume and artist statement. Think about what makes your practice unique to you and compelling. If you can demonstrate why it's unique and compelling to you, it will be compelling to the panel. How can you describe your work in a way that will have the panelists want to come and look back? And when we started, we talked about how any given year, we might receive 300 applications or more. And so sometimes these panelists, depending on their discipline, are reviewing 80 applications or 30 applications. What can you do with your application that is gonna make that panelist say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna flag this application because I wanna come back. What makes you stand out? And that really is 
your statement of your work and why your work is important to you. And also to keep in mind that these panelists are educated and informed, but not informed about your specific practice as an artist. We do a lot of work with the panelists to introduce them to Alaska, to hear from artists in Alaska or representatives throughout the state to talk about the uniqueness and, and, and um, benefits, but also challenges of being an artist in Alaska, but they don't know about you as an artist. And so this application is an opportunity for you to show the panelists who you are. And then once you present this best package of your work, hit submit and then let go of the outcome and know that you presented your best self. And if you don't get awarded this year, maybe it's not your year. There's a new panel every year. Take what you've learned from this application and apply again. Um, you know, some applicants will receive an award their first year. Some won't. Um, uh, this past cycle, we had an applicant who applied every year for 10 years and on the 11th received a fellowship. So it really is sometimes not reflective of your work, the quality of your application, the quality of your work images. It might just be not your year and not your panel. Okay, so this is the last component and we'll just kind of dive through this quickly because we do have um, those toolkits on how to present really great work samples. So we'll first talk about video and audio. And so these are really for the movement-based arts disciplines or uh, music-based arts disciplines. Anything that requires some kind of sound or movement to convey your practice. And so the basics are focus and clarity, making sure that the image is not blurry, that it's clean and clear and crisp, that there's a general white balance um, and uh, so there isn't different varied lighting in your, unless it's part of your <laughs> um, practice, but very even lighting across um, the video, that the sound quality is clear and crisp, and that your video or audio is either um, clipped to the um, uh, time limits or is queued up for the panel. Um, audio and work samples have a time limit. It's up to 10 total minutes if those are the samples. And so you can submit different three minute um, segments or a 10 minute segment. But if you submit a 30 minute video, the panelists are not going to watch the whole thing. So cue them on the minutes you want them to see within the time limits or give them a, a clip of what that is. We also uh, encourage folks not to submit reels of work. So panelists want to see examples of a full piece or an excerpt of a full piece. They don't want to see a three minute reel that is different, you know, seven different dance performances back to back because it doesn't give them a good example of the work and the piece itself. So no reels, clips of, of the work itself. So just some really quick poor work samples that are pretty self-evident, you don't want it to be blurry and you want it to be accessible. This happens every year. If a video is set to private, if a password is not provided, the panel cannot open it. Either set it to public or unlisted, that way staff can open the file and the panelists can open the file. We don't have time, um, but I did wanna show a good video sample, and I will send you all, encourage you to view this uh, short film from Bjorn Olsen, who is a 2021 recipient called Seabird Memorial. It's a short film that is exquisitely presented and was included in Bjorn's application. So this is a good example of a video. It's very clear. It's very crisp. It was in the right time frame for the panel and really demonstrated his expertise as a filmmaker. For written works. Written works are any type of literary art samples or any other multidiscipline samples that will require literary components. Of course, they should be typed neatly and clearly reproduced, proofread for any typos or spellings, really following the, the literary art sample guidelines. So 
fonts aren't out of size, margins are followed. Um, and again, same with queuing the panel. If you are sending chapters of a work, there's a, a page limit for literary art samples. Select the excerpt of your uh, chapter or book or extended writing piece. Select the pages that best capture the story and best capture your writing sample. Uh, if you know someone submits 30 pages when the limit is 15, the panelists, the panel aren't going to read those full 30 pages. So select the excerpt that best represents the story and gives them the most accessible perspective into your writing style. And make sure those track changes are off. So a, a poor work, work sample would be something like this, that the artist forgot to turn off the track changes. The panel will still read through it, but it might give them pause on your ability to execute the project. Good work samples are clean and crisp and really are directly taken from the literary sample, whether it's a book narrative or um, a script to a screenplay. Four photos, and this is the last bit, um, and then we'll jump into the Q&A. Now, photos are um, uh, often used for visual arts, but other disciplines might want to use photographs to demonstrate their work as well. Performance art, sometimes dance, they might want to include a still image to capture uh, that expression. So with photos, it's always great to have a background that is neutral, white, black, or gray, and to use natural light when it's most available to place work so that there's even lighting, so there aren't hot spots or low spots or um, uh, reflections on the piece, to crop the image so that the work is what is being shown or to place it on a neutral background. Um, you wanna limit the distractions for the panelists. You wanna show the panelists the work and not the gallery or the studio that the work is in so that they can hone in on the work itself. And then always determine if a professional photographer would help. Um, again, we have a resource in our online toolkit on how to take good quality images just with a smartphone if you don't have access to a photographer. So we'll just do a couple of these for sake of time. Um, and then um, we'll turn it over to the Q&A. So uh, I'm just gonna poll the audience and you can feel free to use your reactions or a thumbs up. And I just wanna check if we're looking at this work sample, we're not thinking about the work itself, but the photograph of the work sample, would we say that this is a good quality or poor quality work sample? Thumbs up, good, thumbs down, not so good. I see one thumbs down, couple thumbs down, thumbs down. Yep, exactly. So this would be a work sample that needs improvement. There's multiple images in this work sample. Now we don't know if the artist is trying to, to cheat the system and send more than the 10 um, artist samples that they're allowed, or if this is a um, collage piece, if this is an installation, we don't know which work is which. There's too many. It's multiple images. Um, also, there's not great craftsmanship. We can see it looks like they're ripped out of sketchbooks. Is this a work in progress? Is this a finished work? There's too many questions for the panelists. What about this uh, sculpture? Good quality, poor quality. We see one thumbs down, we see a couple thumbs up. Now we would say that this is a good quality. There is a little bit of a high spot of light, but it is a good example of wall hanging sculptural work. Work. It's relatively evenly lit. It's a good quality image. We don't have any distractions around it. It's closely cropped. We can zoom in and see details if we wanted to. Uh, we'll just do a couple more. Good quality, poor quality. I see one thumbs down, several thumbs down. Y'all y'all are on it. Yes, poor quality. We don't know if this is a finished piece, it's, if it's in process, it's distracting with the, the studio work around it. 
if the artist wanted to crop in on just this work, it, the quality would be acceptable. But as it is, there's just too much going on. So we'll just skip through here and I'll bring you to this image. Now this was uh, given to us for use by Karen Lowell, who is our fantastic contractor who works with artists. And she uh, gave this to us to show uh, the same artwork photographed by uh, a smartphone. I think Karen, this was your smartphone and a professional photographer. So the image on the right is a great image. It shows the work, it's clear, it's cropped nicely, it's on a neutral background, it's evenly lit, we can zoom in. The image on the left is the same piece taken by a professional photographer. And you can see the professional photographer had the lighting equipment and had the, the types of cameras that really elevate this work sample. And we understand that everybody has access to a professional photographer, but you could include in your budget for a project award or a fellowship to hire a photographer to take images of your work. All right, so just a couple things to keep in mind. Um, and that is that this is a one year period. So if it's a project or a fellowship, can it be done in one year? Do your artist statement and resume support your plan? Is there consistency? If your artist statement shows that you're a ceramic artist, but you're applying for photography, what's the leap there? Um, if your work is community focused, that's okay. We understand that lots of artists are more social practice or civic practice artists, but how will it, it connect to your personal growth as an artist? It's an individual award. How is it gonna impact you or your collaborative individually? And then have you been able to communicate what makes your work unique to you? All right, Whew. with that, um, I'm going to uh, give you all a break from hearing my voice. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Katie um, to help facilitate um, a Q&A. Um, Katie, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, if you just want to start us off, I'll start going through the chat um, and pulling from there. Great. Thank you, Anzina. And I do have uh, one question uh, from the chat marked for you. Um, but folks, if you have questions, you can use um, the raise hand function um, down on your toolbar. You can also in real life, raise your hand. I can see everyone with their video on, so I should be able to see you to call on you. Um, you can also use the chat box to um, register your questions and we'll get you an answer to your question if you pop it in the chat box. And I'm not seeing any immediate hands raised. So I'm gonna go to a question that Joe had. Thank you, Stacy, and I'll get right back to you. So here's a question that Joe asked earlier. If awarded a fellowship grant, can you finish working a seasonal job before embarking on a focused year of exploration? Or do you have to begin immediately? That's a great question. It does not have to begin immediately. Um, so it can be, you know, as some project awards are for uh, really short term projects that might take a couple months within that year period. Um, and the same with a fellowship. So it doesn't need to be done right away, right as soon as you get the grant agreement, but it does need to be kind of wrapped up within that year. We do know that some projects are ongoing. And so we just ask that you clarify that um, when you'll start it and uh, where it will be at the end of that year. So if it's something that is kind of ongoing, just include that in the description. Um, but also talk about what you would focus on within that year. You know, we have artists that propose um, completing a novel, but then there's going to be steps after that year with working with editing and publication. So we understand that it's ongoing, just be clear about it. Great, thank you. And Stacy, did you have a question? Yeah, um, living on Kodiak, you know, we really don't have a lot of places uh, or opportunity to do an individual show. Mm -hmm. um, our last art gallery, Northern Exposure, closed about four or five years ago, and um, I had individual shows there. But you know, since that time, we really we don't have a place to do that. And as part of a fellowship grant, can you write in um, a place 
outside of your own community where you'd like, hopefully like to have an individual show. Um, is that a possibility? Uh, I'm gonna ping it to Karen who's shaking her head. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, I, uh, as a contractor, I'm working with Rasmussen, but I'm also an awardee. And one of the things that I wrote in my fellowship application was the opportunity to go attend residencies out of state, to visit museums out of state, to just collect information outside of my community. So yes, what I would suggest though, is be very specific about what you want to accomplish. Don't just say, I wanna go abroad. Say, I have, I have very specific interests in attending this program in Ireland. I have been in communication with these people. I have an invitation or I have submitted applications to those, those opportunities. Yeah, I totally get where you're coming from. Alaska is so remote and so like kind of outside of the field of the, the bigger art world, but yeah. And if you have any questions at all about how to present this or how to like structure your proposal, please give me a holler. It's um, arts at rasmussen.org. Thank you. Ah. Great, thank you. I see a question from Alyssa. Any advice from for emerging artists? I've been a lifelong artist. However, I'm striving to begin a career. Quiana. Mm -hmm. Karen, do you want to take that on too? Um, I just answered an email today about somebody who has been making work and has been like exhibiting things in rest in restaurants and has been involved in group shows and maybe has done a couple of like activities. Just just have a lot of faith in the work that you're doing. Like just mm -hmm. because you're an emerging artist does not mean that your work is not valuable. So I would say especially in the resume and your artist statement, speak from your heart and include any relevant experience that supports the work that you're doing. Indicate the things that you want to do in the future and just, just be very direct. Don't get intimidated about writing this stuff. Like the panelists are people, they are artists. Mm -hmm. they, they are completely excited when they hear somebody who has like, um, conviction and, and power in their voice, just speak authentically when you're talking about your work and what you're doing. Okay. Yeah. And I'll add to that. We all were once emerging artists, regardless of the <laughs> yeah. stage, we might still be emerging artists. Uh, lots of the staff at the foundation are practicing artists. Um, and, and we all emerged at one point and are somewhere along that path. And the work, like Karen said, is valuable and important and have, um, you know, hold true to that and be able to communicate where you're starting and why this work is important to you and why you've been a lifelong artist. Why have you had this part of your, um, your identity? Um, that's the most important piece. Yeah. Why do I you also keep want making this work. Yes. I also want to tag on something Maya Tay said earlier, and Karen, um, you know, we both reiterated this that we encourage you to reach out to us for mm -hmm. support. And we know that it can be intimidating. Um, I, uh, I uh, like Karen, as a previous artist award recipient before I ever worked at the foundation. And I would never have reached out <laughs> to the foundation to ask any question because I was so intimidated. And we really want to break that barrier down and say, we are here for you. We are here to offer any support that we can. I'm just going to offer a little tiny anecdote. I, I applied probably five times for either a project award or a fellowship. And finally, one of my friends, an artist friend said, Karen, have you ever actually had anybody like look at your writing and I'm like no and he's like you might want to think about that and as soon as I started reaching out to people to just like get feedback the the writing got stronger the proposal got stronger and then I did actually get an, an award so yeah <laughs> um, there is one more question in the chat I'm seeing about um, the Alaska State Council on the Arts um, Adaptation and Innovation Grant, they're not connected at all. In fact, if you did get one of those grants, 
put that in your resume because that shows that you've have, you have already received support from people who are supporting artists. Yep, Great. absolutely. Thank you. Any any final questions? Jot your questions down and then send them to us, okay? That's what we're here for. The quickest way to get a reply is arts at rasmussen.org and you are likely to hear directly from Karen. Um, I think uh, I think we can wrap it up. We're so grateful um, to share this virtual space with you all for your patience as we kind of clunked through some <laughs> tech, some technologies. Um, and uh, uh, I'll turn it over to you, Katie, to close us out. Great. Thank you. Thank you for inviting Kodiak artists for this very specific opportunity. And artists, it was great to see you all and spend some time with you this evening. And I hope we get some very strong and competitive applications to this opportunity. I'm also happy to be a resource for anyone. Um, obviously, you can get in touch with the program officers directly, and they're your best resource. But I'm here locally and accessible. So feel free to reach out to me as well if I can help you. Um, thanks again. Have a great night, everyone.